Good morning, everyone. Uh, settled after your break? Okay. Uh, yes, I'm John Curran. I'm the president and CEO of Aaron, uh, which is the American Registry for Internet Numbers, the one of the five regional internet registries that coordinates IP addresses. Uh, we handle 25, 26 economies, including Canada, U.S., and about half of the Caribbean. Um, what I'm going to be talking about today is internet governance, and I'm going to provide you a framework for thinking about it. I'm going to talk a little bit about where it's going. I'm going to talk about how you need to get involved. Um, hopefully, it should be an informative session. I'll leave a few minutes at the end for questions and answers. So let me just get started. Um, <clears throat> internet governance. I'm going to read you this because it's so important. This is my favorite slide. So it's now your favorite slide, at least for the next 25 minutes. The development and application by governments, the private sector and civil society, in their respective roles of shared principles, norms, rules, decision-making procedures, and programs that shape the evolution and use of the internet. Now, this isn't a random definition I threw up here. It actually comes out of um, the WISIS meeting that occurred in 2005, something that we affectionately in industry call the Tunis Agenda. It was the, um, one of the outputs was a document that stated um, certain principles about internet governance. This paragraph is a key paragraph. It basically says what's in scope for internet governance. And if you think about it, internet governance is somewhat new because governance, in fact, in some languages, um, it's very hard to translate internet governance. The words for governance imply something local over a territory or people, and internet governance is inherently global, inherently involving multiple jurisdictions and multiple people. So uh, it's a very new concept. There are other things like this, the climate, space, Antarctica, um, but it turns out um, uh, waterways, admiralty law, but it turns out internet governance affects so many people on a personal level. When you're dealing with maritime law, you're involving a small number of vessels that might run into each other at sea. Uh, same thing when you're dealing with Antarctica, when you're dealing with um, uh, situations like that. Um, the internet could involve you and a service provider accessing a website in three different countries, all dealing with different laws and different applications. So um, this is a pretty important definition. There's some words in here that I'm not sure when it was written everyone really understood. That in their respective roles is one of them. We'll talk about that. Coordination of many aspects, technical standards, policies, infrastructure that make the internet work, involving governments, private sector, civil society. Um, civil society, um, associations working on behalf of individuals, humanity, uh, academia, uh, private sector, businesses, um, governments, we all know what those are. So, the determines how the internet's used, um, now and in the future. Outcomes could affect a lot of people, okay? Everybody uses the internet today. So the outcomes of internet governance get to affect everyone. Pretty obvious, but think about it. We have a situation where we're making decisions that will affect the entire globe. In fact, <clears throat> the internet is more than just um, wires and network and service. It's actually now a huge force. Um, the internet is, you just see what's happening. There's more communication and more individual empowerment than you've ever had before. And political, yes, there's quite a bit of political implications to having a global communication media where anyone can talk to anyone. So we, we run the risk of endangering or the opportunity to promote these causes when we talk about internet governance. Um, a lot of different people have a lot of different views on how these things should be addressed. And in fact, it's really, when you're talking about internet governance, it's generally not an IP address policy or a particular protocol or uh, whether or not a particular label can be used in DNS. 
that is driving a lot of the heat and the passion. It's behind the scenes people thinking about what's the political implication of a certain label in DNS? What is the economic implications of that protocol? And so now that people have realized how important the internet is, they realize these little decisions have significant impl uh, implications. Um, you're, you're not gonna believe this, but you're involved in internet governance. And because you're involved in internet governance, you're affecting something that affects the entire globe. And so you probably won't have an opportunity to make a bigger impact, some of you will. I mean, some of you will go on to invent the next company and the next widget that we all buy and will be wonderful. And some of you will create and solve cancer. But for a lot of you, participating in internet governance may actually have the biggest impact on the globe of anything you do. Okay. What's at stake for the users? Access, stability, security. For the community, the ability to innovate, the ability to evolve the internet. This isn't obvious because people think, well, you know, it's the internet. I can create any program I want. On the internet today, you can create any program you want because the internet doesn't give you a lot of requirements. You don't have to register as a global a smartphone application developer and be approved by regulatory authorities. You don't need a license to run a website. Now people go, yeah, well that's, that's, that's the internet. That's, that's why it's great. It's not obvious that that's the way the internet will run in 20 years. It is quite possible you will go get your website license, okay? Because you're putting up a website and we need to make sure it's run pro appropriately. So, I don't want you to take the conventions of how the internet's run today to be inevitably how it's run in the future. That's actually what internet governance is all about. Okay, so I'm gonna give a couple of slides on what Aaron does and then I'm gonna talk about what's changing and then what you need to do. So um, since we've been doing this since 1997, um, we have a lot of experience being involved in these discussions. Regionally, we work within the region to predominantly work on internet number policy. So the policies by which IP addresses are managed, allocated, transferred. We make sure people know that they can participate in that. Our policy uh, discussions are open to everyone. You don't have to be a member of Aaron to participate. You can go online, see the policy proposals, and those do impact you. As ISPs and service providers, um, the policies we use for managing the IP addresses they have an impact to you. You want to make sure you have ISPs that are useful. Uh, we actually have uh, um, protocol policies in some cases developed for specific regions or specific problems. We have one for Caribbean, for example, because the size of their ISPs is slightly different. We've had a region, uh, we've had a policy that we were adopted that accommodates the needs for resellers up in Canada because of circumstances up here. So you can get involved in that, but I'm not really here to talk about that. Global level global internet governance. Now, uh, Aaron is involved. We follow uh, regulatory decisions globally. We're involved with uh, organizations such as we're a member of the ITU. Um, we uh, participate in some of the other forums I'll talk about. We uh, maintain, support, and defend the multi-stakeholder approach to policy development. Multi-stakeholder approach. Back on that first slide, we were talking about everyone being involved. Multi-stakeholder is exactly that. Everyone has a voice. Everyone gets a say. So that means there's no party who's left out because they can't participate. We defend this globally for all internet critical resources. Internet critical resources, what's that? Names, numbers, uh, protocol, parameters are critical internet resources, meaning in order to use the internet, they have to be coordinated. We have to have one global registry for all the IP addresses. We may delegate it out into five regions, but the numbers have to be unique. Same thing with domain. We have to have a globally unique domain system for it to make sense to everyone. And so we, we advocate that, that, that these resources that are critical to successful internet operation be managed in a multi-stakeholder way. Um, and we work with international organizations and governments to explain that they need to work in these processes as well. So it's kind of boring. It's actually not all that exciting. It's something we've been doing for decades. No one really cares about it. Okay, except it's all changing. I'm gonna talk about four ways it's changing. First, last month, <clears throat> 
Um, a group of us in the internet community, this includes uh, the regional registries, ISOC, um, which is the Internet Society, which advances the purposes of the Internet, the IETF, the Internet Engineering Task Force, uh, the folks at ICANN, which handle domain name policy, the folks at W3C, who work on the uh, World Wide Web protocols. Uh, a group of us get together periodically, and we work on Internet cooperation. And uh, we were in Montevideo um, a month ago, and we realized some changes were happening, and it was important to make plain where, these, where um, these changes were happening and how we felt. So the leaders of uh, these organizations who were gathered, we issued a statement. In some cases, people signed as individuals. But the fact is that all of the organizations involved in internet cooperation uh, were uh, united in one purpose, to make plain that how we run the internet is going to change. Um, <clears throat> so, I'm going to talk about that. I'm going to talk about the Internet Governance Forum, something that came out of WISIS and actually happened just two weeks ago. I'm going to talk about the World Telecommunications Development Conference, the ITU Development Sector Conference, which is coming up. And then I'm going to talk about the ITU Plenipotentiary Conference next year. Each of these has a huge impact on how we go ahead with the Internet. So the Montevideo Statement on the Future of Internet Cooperation, signed in October. Uh, signed by ICANN, IET, the leaders of ICANN, IETF, IAB, W3C, ISOC, and the five regional registries. Um, <clears throat> we noted the need to strengthen and evolve how we do internet cooperation. And we've been doing this very successfully, but we've got some challenges. Um, we want to keep the internet hung together. We want one internet. We don't want 10 internets or 170 internets. And it turns out that there's been some developments that could easily lead us to a fragmented internet. Uh, among these developments include, um, we, it was revealed over the summer that there's pervasive monitoring going on on the internet. A lot of organizations are not thrilled about that. And in fact, it's led people to say, maybe they should segment their internet. Maybe they should have a national internet. Maybe they should have a regional internet. We think a global internet is the right answer, and we want to reinforce that model. And uh, we want people to be able to use the internet and have faith in it. So a major point was to point out we're committed to a single internet. Not regional internets, not national internets, a single internet. One network for everyone. Um, we identified the need to get people organized and excited about working together for the internet. Now, um, this is very hard. Turns out we've all been doing this individually, but we don't have a lot of, co a lot of umbrella coordination or organization. We also don't have a lot of involvement by all the stakeholders. The technical community is well involved because of the IETF. The uh, technical community running networks are involved through the regional registries. Um, the folks who are involved in web protocol design through W3C. And some of us, uh, I can obviously for the people involved in the DNS community, DNS registries and registrars. But that's not the entire internet. And while we welcome every stakeholder to these organizations, and while we welcome governments to participate, that's still not a very um, welcoming model. The average organization out there, your average individual, doesn't understand that we want internet governance to be open and we want it to be for everyone. So we decided we gotta make it plainer. We can't just be quiet organizations that say we're running the internet. We need to make sure everyone knows, every government knows, every international organization knows if they wanna be involved in setting these norms and policies and principles, if they wanna be involved in cooperation, they should come and get involved. Now, <clears throat> This also means something else. Um, some of this infrastructure is organized uh, under ICANN, um, the International uh, uh, Consortium for Assigned Names and Numbers. And ICANN has a function it does. It coordinates the central registries, which uh, they refer to as the IANA function. Uh, this is done under an MOU with the IETF. The IETF develops internet protocols, and those protocols have protocol fields, and those fields have values. The IETF has an agreement with ICANN, where ICANN will uh, 
help manage the registration of those and also run policy processes, for example, for names and numbers. Names they do directly, numbers they do through the RIRs. Realistically, that was very important at the beginning of the internet. Um, in fact, as Aaron, was, Aaron manages numbers, we were originally, uh, we were formed as a successor registry to something that was a direct US government contract. And so it's not surprising, given the origin of all this, that the coordination of these are still have relationships with the US government. But in light of developments, uh, it's important to globalize. It's important that, that the internet be self-sufficient and not uh, dependent or have any unique relationship with any one government. And so we called for accelerating the globalization of ICANN and IANA towards an environment where all stakeholders, including all governments, participate on an equal footing. This doesn't look like much, but it turns out it's uh, created a bit of a ripple. Um, there's a lot of governments who are saying, I didn't know how to get involved, and I, or I didn't want to get involved because I couldn't see that I had a, a seat at the table that was equal to every other seat at the table. Um, the organizations responsible for coordinating uh, much of this infrastructure have said, we want all governments involved, and we want them all involved on equal footing. And then uh, we also reminded people about that IPv6. Um, the internet has got a unique supply of IPv4 numbers, 4.3 billion. Uh, we've run out in two regions. We're going to run out in the Aran region in about six to eight months, depending on who you believe. And um, if you're running a website and you're not connected with both IPv4 and IPv6 for your public-facing website, you are not fully on the internet today. There are customers being connected to the internet only with IPv6. If you have a website which is only IPv4, there are people who will have to use translation to get to you. So we called for all content on the internet to be made reachable via both IPv4 and IPv6. There was a meeting last month in Bali I'm gonna talk about where we followed up on this. And let me move right to that. So um, the Internet Governance Forum. The Internet Governance Forum was formed out of that WISIS discussion that I started with in 2005, was formed out of the Tunis Agenda. And the Internet Governance Forum is a group that gets together once a year. Uh, we've done, so, wow, we're up to a very large number. I don't actually know. might be 10. Um, we've done a number of IGFs, um, and uh, one each year. And uh, in an IGF, it meets for a week long with sessions running concurrently in a dozen rooms. There will be... Uh, several hundred sessions where people talk about internet governance matters. You can remotely participate in these sessions. And so it's something you can monitor, you can send comments online. Okay, it's a non-decisional forum. It was set up to help share information, and that's what happened. People share information at IGF. So some of the sharing that we did at the, the signers of the Montevideo Statement is we told everyone, we want more than the current internet governance structures. We want more cooperation, more governments to be involved, not involved dictating output, but involved at a seat at the table having discussions on what the norms and policies should be. Um, it was actually a very successful IGF meeting. Um, and there's also discussions about evolving IGF. So IGF's non-decisional. Governments are used to decisional proceedings. Governments are used to something called multilaterals. Multilaterals are treaty organizations where people, governments come together, they all agree to give up a certain amount to get a benefit from the agreement as a whole. Multilateral agreements exist for, well, organizations you know, World Trade Organization, the ITU, the United Nations. These are all multilateral organizations. Governments are members to multilaterals. The IGF is not a multilateral. It, the IGF actually, the UN nicely provides secretariat service for the IGF, uh, which is very convenient when you have a meeting internationally. It's sometimes good to be able to do it under the auspices of an organization like the UN. But at the end of the day, the IGF is truly just a gathering to share information. Well, governments look at this and go, if there's no decision coming out of this, how do I make my public policy work? I have a mandate to protect my economic needs or my cultural needs. And why am I going to IGF? It's not leading to decisions. Well, it's still improving communication. It's getting people talking about these things. There is an initiative underway. Uh, there's actually an ITU Council working group 
uh, on enhanced cooperation. And that working group is looking at the future of the IGF and trying to figure out, should it change? Should it be more decisional with more outcomes? Um, enhanced cooperation turns out to be a very interesting phrase. And it's also back on that first page. We talked about it. The, what, we, what did we talk about? We talked about in their respective roles. That turns out to be key. Everyone has a different idea about respective roles. If you're a government, you might believe your respective role is making the regulations for the internet because you make regulations for a lot of things. But governments inherently make regulations for things within their own scope, but the internet's global and has to work globally. So it's not clear we actually have agreement on in their respective roles on what everyone's role is. Part of that feeds into the Internet Governance Forum and what should the cooperation be? And what does, how do we strengthen, how do we enhance the cooperation? So the goal would be to, and not just talk about these uh, in 100 sessions, various topics, cyber crime, protection of children, protection of culture, um, you know, online copyright enforcement. Uh, we would be talking about select number of problems and talking at a table where we try to actually come to solutions internet-wide for these. Now, that sounds very similar to what happens in a multilateral organization. The only difference is we're proposing everyone sit at the table and talk about it equally, not that we all provide input to governments and they make a decision. So um, that's where the tension is in this internet governance field. I want to talk about something coming up. Um, first, I have to introduce the ITU. Uh, the ITU is um, the International Telecommunications Union. It's been around, well, more than 100 years, uh, back in the time of, of Telegram. Um, and it does a lot, number of very important things. It handles, for example, uh, spectrum allocations globally and coordination of spectrum maps. Same with satellite orbits. You may not realize it, but satellite orbits are tied to spectrum in a way that isn't obvious, but turns out to be very important. Um, they also handle telecommunication standards. The reason we have a phone network and touch tone dialing and roaming and a whole bunch of other things is because of the ITU. And they have a development branch, the ITU-D, which works with developing countries to help advance telecommunications in that area. It's not really clear where the internet fits with respect to telecom. Um, I've heard people say, that if you look at the ITU, if it's something that is a transmission and it goes between two economies, two countries, it's automatically in the ITU. That's the way the chart is written. I've had someone else say it's actually completely excluded. It's enhanced communication and it was never meant to be regulated and therefore it's never meant to be part of the ITU. We'll come back to this topic. Um, fact is the ITU is a very successful organization, very essential to making telephony run. It's par it works on very important standards through the ITU uh, D, uh, the ITU T piece. Um, but again, there's the dance of, is that the type of organization to do internet development, internet standards and governance? Um, in the past, this topic has come up a bit in the ITU. Uh, and uh, the internet community has shown up and said, no, we don't believe that it is inherently the place it should happen. Why? Because it's not an equal table. We don't all sit and share the same view and work towards consensus. We advise governments and they will take a vote. At the end of the day, they're the party that has the vote. Last year, there was a meeting called Wicket. Uh, in Dubai, WCIT, and in that meeting, they were going to update the International Telecommunications Regulations, the ITRs, that are used for the ITU as a basis for regulating telecommunications. Um, first time these regulations had been picked up in 25 years, so it's been just a few changes in 25 years. Um, you might have heard there was a pretty serious fallout. Um, the ITU indicated it was going to be operated according to consensus, it would be a consensus discussion. At the end of the day, that isn't exactly what happened. About 40 countries indicated that they would not be able to proceed, uh, and in fact, there was no agreement on the update. That's the type of thing that we can't have. We can't have the internet split into pieces. We can't reach no consensus. It can't be, at the end of the day, something decided by a vote by just governments. And so um, we pay a lot of attention 
Uh, we want to work with all organizations, including the ITU, um, but we want to make sure we work in a manner that is constructive, and we're trying to build that out of the IGF and out of the internet community and the basis that we've had for success. There is a WTDC, which is the World Telecommunications Development Conference coming up. Uh, it's coming up in March, it's very important. It will uh, end up uh, setting the agenda for how the ITU uh, handles problems with developing countries and communications. And uh, it will be um, something, participation is open to ITU D members, uh, and they will set their agenda. And if you're a developing country, the internet's a big challenge. Right now, the internet poses interesting problems because at the end of the day, the internet has, your people are spending more and more money to use the internet. That money doesn't seem to be going to your local economy, it's going to carriers, but it's going also to services that are in other countries. You know it's important for communications, but you can't see the economic benefit and uh, we actually went to one of these in Guadalajara just a few years ago. We have one more coming up in two years. And uh, participation opportunities are limited. It's very much member states, governments who participate, where they could potentially make clear and revise the ITU's charter so that governments are the only ones that have a say in internet activities if they were to include the internet in the ITU charter. So we'll be involved, as we were two years ago, in making voices heard, uh, in educating governments about the importance of this. Um, so that's at a high level what's happening. We have the Montevideo Statement, which is the internet community attempting to build a better framework for internet governance. We have the, if I can go back, yeah, you actually can. So we have the Montevideo Statement, which is leading to a better dialogue for internet governance. We have the Internet Governance Forum, which came out of the WISIS agenda, um, has a secretary from the UN, and they are looking at how to become potentially a open forum that leads to outcomes, and it's more than just an open discussion, but an open discussion where it actually deliberates towards a particular recommendation. And we have the ITU initiatives uh, coming up both in terms of WTDC and in terms of the plenipotentiary. Now, I put this slide up and a lot of people look and go, oh, he's getting to the end. He's talking about how I get involved. I am actually coming to the end, but I, I want to be very plain. This is very important. We have a page that covers these events, covers the positions going on, talks about the filings for the Aran region, Canada, US, and the Caribbean, that we're making on your behalf, um, tells you how you can get involved in some of the events going on. So for example, if there's a call for participation, many of these can be remotely participated in and many of them have public policy input. They do a call for input where you can actually file comments. Now, you may not think it matters, okay? You don't have a vote in some of these organizations. But you do have a voice and it does matter. Um, I've watched over 15 years running several successful telecom companies. I've watched a number of work groups get up and go, go out to lunch. You know, a bunch of people are busy working in a room on network architecture and they decide it's lunchtime, they get up, they go out for lunch. And it's amazing because 10 people going out for lunch, one of them will say, I, I can't go there, it's seafood, I'm allergic. Okay. Uh, one of them will say, I, I can't go to the steakhouse, it's, it's too much, it's too much money. Well, that narrows that one down. Once you've got the places people can't accommodate, a group of people going out to lunch will then say, well, where do we want to go? And people may be thinking, I like the sandwich shop. We always go to the sandwich shop. If someone comes up with a different idea, maybe we'll do Indian, Chinese. Maybe we'll come up with, uh, we'll go to the curry place. Everyone may have their own idea. But in a group of 10, it's usually only two or three that will actually end up leading your group to lunch. Now, there's a lot of voices opportunity. You have an opportunity to be a voice. If you're not a voice, you will get led somewhere, I promise you. You may not have a, vo you may not have a vote, but the number of people speaking matters, okay? It's possible that if you don't speak, you'll be led someplace you don't expect. Even if you don't think it matters, please get involved, please lend your voice, pay attention to this page, um, don't end up eating sawdust. 
Okay. Uh, questions and answers. I have uh, about five minutes. We got about two minutes. We got about two minutes. We got about two minutes. So, Bill's the boss. Get myself out of the blinding light here. Um, with the governments, it used to be a, a number of Western governments would push for openness of the internet. Through um, now, these governments have been found to <clears throat> perform uh, surveillance and other stuff that they were criticizing other governments of doing, so on and so forth. Does this risk changing the way the internet is governed in, in terms of, of which governments are going to have credibility and, and so on and so forth? If you get yes. some comments on that. Short answer. So um, if you go back to the Montevideo statement, reinforced the importance of a globally coherent internet operations and warned against internet fragmentation. The fact is that a lot of governments uh, do surveillance on the internet. Um, uh, a lot of governments didn't realize that were going on and are surprised it's going on. But in any case, the fact that it is going on means a single government being uniquely in charge of internet infrastructure is probably not acceptable globally. It's that simple. So if you can't have one government, now the US government has actually done a very good job, folks. Uh, let's be real, the internet's a success. They have a very much hands-off policy. I can't think of a case where the community came to a decision and the US government said, no, not left, go right instead. I, I don't know of that. And they say we hold this so that the community can make the decisions on domain name policy and IP addresses and protocols. All of that might be true, but you still don't want any one government uniquely in charge if you know that governments are involved in surveillance. You just don't. So I would say a lot of this, um, while not directly consequential, certainly were um, moved along because of the discussions of the summer. Does that help? One more? Doing research for the World Research Organization, we have a loophole with the internet in the Asian communities, especially those, um, I think, Afghanistan, the way they don't want to have the internet broadly educated in that culture. What can we do? How can we reach in there? Okay, so if I understand the question, the question is you have some cases where you have governments that don't wish to have its people be empowered by the internet. Is that roughly correct? Yes, okay. And, and this is an interesting problem because um, you know, clearly um, the internet's community approach to this has always been everyone should be able to have use of the internet. And in fact, you'd be amazed how creative people are about getting the internet to places. Because it's not regulated, anybody who's an internet subscriber can modulo their agreement with their upstream customer provider, can become an ISP and connect someone else. That's why the internet grew. It grew at the edges. Um, and in fact, it does even now today do that. It grows across boundaries where because it's not regulated. There are countries that have internet access because people have decided to share internet access and they think it's important to have communication. What we're trying to actually avoid is a case where internet communication becomes a political tool. We don't want the case where someone says, I don't want you to have communication because I don't believe in your political beliefs, your religious beliefs, your, your, um, you know, your uh, human rights beliefs, and therefore you can't have internet access. The best thing we can do is keep the structures of governing the internet that we have today, reinforce them, Welcome governments, welcome governments to the table as an equal participant in these discussions and not go to a model which is strictly governmental controlled. In a model where every government is responsible for approving, authorizing, and regulating the internet in its own regime, and that is truly what has to happen to grow the internet, um, governments controlling, for example, the names, the numbers that are used in the internet, it's impossible for people to do what they think is right. In an internet that we have today, which is open and connected, that actually, in some cases, is solving those problems. And so we want to keep the current model, strengthen it, welcome more governments to the table as equals. I think that will help us continue with the successes we had. It's not a perfect model. Remember that in some cases, when governments get really upset, they actually use that unique power that they have, the ability to use force. And so we can't really do much about that. But if we keep the internet as open as we can, then it should hopefully get to any place that we can do it. Does that answer your question? 
Thank you. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed uh, the ISP conference. Glad, glad to be here today. Thank you, John. All right, we're going to uh, move right along quickly into our uh, next.